All right, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Um, so I wrote a new C++ compiler, and the main conceit of that is that I could win at the metaprogramming game if I were able to execute any kind of statement at compile time. So I have a token, it's called meta. I put meta in front of a statement and then it runs it at compile time. So meta printf is a compile time printf and so on. Meta, meta four is a uh, compile time on world loop. Um, so I, I, I did a lot of kind of cool meta programming work with this and then the compiler got more and more capable and I decided to move in a different direction, which is trying to incorporate other languages, other domain specific languages directly in C++. So I embedded GLSL, which is the OpenGL and Vulkan shading language into C++ by absorbing thousands of declarations, mostly function declarations, uh, implementing vectors and matrices as first class objects, and then adding dozens of C++ attributes to support OpenGL and Vulkan, uh, and also now uh, DirectX uh, Dixel intermediate language as first class language features. Um, and over the, the Last, last year when I was working on this, it kind of developed and I realized I could kind of head it in the direction of CUDA and turn Vulkan compute into something that looks and feels a lot like CUDA, while at the same time uh, maintaining the advantages of Vulkan, which is that it's cross vendor, um, cross platform, and you get not just compute, but you get all the graphic stages and you get ray tracing. Um, and it's, it's quite terrific. So what I'm gonna do is, is kind of explore the design space of how compilers and GPUs can interact. So we'll start off here on my screen. I have a CUDA kernel. This is a Saxby. Um, and what it, what it shows is that NVCC has adopted new front end features. It's got a global attribute to indicate that this is a kernel and has a launch bounds into attribute to indicate that you can expect to, to run on 128 threads. It takes function parameters, which are gonna be communicated between the host and the device um, using like some high speed memory with like a push constant, and then it's going to uh, perform this operation. Things like the launch chevron are also an aspect of this. So uh, let me show you how this compiles and what it generates. So when I can compile this, this program, it generates PTEX, which is an intermediate representation that it was uh, invented by NVIDIA to allow separate versioning between the hardware ISA, the instruction set architecture, and this intermediate representation. So the compiler emits PTEX, which is uh, cross-generation, and then the NVIDIA driver itself boils this down to whatever ISA uh, corresponds to the uh, hardware that you're running at the moment. So this is CUDA. So what, is, what does GLSL look like? This is uh, GLSL for the same program. Uh, it's a lot more verbose, but this will target graphics, raster and, and ray tracing stages, and it will target OpenGL and uh, Vulkan, and there are backends to target Direct3D12 as well. So I have a uniform buffer and there's a specific binding. There's a read-only shader stage buffer object to take the input variables with a binding at one, and a, at binding at two, we have a read-write buffer uh, for, for Y. So these are, these are constants that you have to bind using these specific ordinals, uh, and this is done on the on the on the uh, device or on the on the host side, and then you have a kernel, and the kernel doesn't take any parameters. You have to manually uh, push the parameters through these these uniforms, but it will compile into a very similar looking intermediate representation. So instead of compiling to PTEX, it compiles to something called SpearV, which is a Kronos defined intermediate representation. It's it's more verbose than PTEX but it's also somewhat more flexible in that it supports uh, graphics in addition to compute and also supports uh, OpenCL, which has a different, different variant of, of compute than Vulkan. So I, I wanted to take these attributes and declarations that we'd use to do shader programming and embed them into my C++ compiler. So this is the same version here. This is the same program rewritten in circle. So instead of having these layout qualifiers, I now have C++11 style attributes. So SpearV is an attribute namespace. So you say SpearV colon colon uniform, which is uh, indicates a uniform buffer. Zero is the binding for this uniform buffer. You could also put say three here if we want to do a descriptor set. And then I uh, define the structure and I give it a name. So now this is a uniform buffer object, but it's defined in C++, uh, but it corresponds exactly to this GLSL. I do the same thing with a read-only buffer. So I 
I enter the spear v attribute namespace. I declare a shader stage buffer object. I mark it read only. And then I say it's a float x array with a, uh, unknown bounds. So this is, a, this is another extension I had added to circle to support GLSL semantics, which are uh, arrays of unknown length, or runtime length, rather. Uh, and we can do it for the output buffer. So now I'm, I'm at the kernel. I mark it x turn c so that it turns off name mingling, which is the same thing I did with this CUDA kernel right here. And now I'm going to uh, give it two attributes. One of them is going to be comp to indicate that this is a compute shader. So all the shader entry points need one of the 12 different um, four or five letter codes. Say it's a fragment shader, a vertex shader, a task shader, or a ray generation shader, a compute shader. You have to indicate what the, what the role of this function is. And I'm going to say this is going to run on 128 threads. So it's just like this launch bounds uh, decorator right here in, in CUDA. And then I just have the, the, de the definition. Here I'm using a, a, a GLSL object called GL Global Invocation ID, which gives me the uh, ID of the thread within the entire grid, not just within the block. And this is my Saxby. So now I can compile this with circle. So here's my circle uh, invocation. I'm giving it dash shader. This injects uh, the many thousands of GLSL declarations into your translation unit. I'm dash C dash emit spear V will emit a spear V module. I'm giving, I'm naming an entry point and then I'm, I'm compiling it. And this is what I have right now. So I'm getting more uh, spear V out from this CXX. So the, uh, you could compile GLSL into a spear V module and now you can compile uh, C++ with circle into a spear V module. So the, the problem right now is that CUDA just looks a lot cleaner. It does, it does things a lot more concisely than even circle where um, I've embedded GLSL. You can tell like, I don't have any extraneous uh, objects or buffers running around. I just get to pass things through parameters. And that's, that's really beautiful. However, this isn't supported in GLSL, but we can support it by adding new front end additions. So this is on the left is CUDA and VCC CUDA. On the right is uh, the same code written with uh, all the new bells and whistles I've, I've added into Circle to enhance the capabilities you would get uh, out of GLSL. So um, I'm passing parameters directly to the kernel. I'm passing pointers. Pointers don't exist in GLSL, but they exist in the um, Spear V uh, intermediate representation, and they are supported by Vulkan. So they're, they're a latent capability that I've exposed in a C++ compiler. And um, I, how am I passing all these function parameters to a kernel? They're not supported in GLSL either. They're not in support in Vulkan either. I'm passing them through a push constant. So by, by using the spear v colon colon push C++ attribute, I'm saying all the function parameters in here are going to be implicitly passed from the host to the device through a push constant, which is a small amount of very uh, high speed storage that gets that gets sent along with the with the command uh, uh, payload from the from the host to the device, so this is very similar to the way that um, that the way that CUDA forwards parameters inside the launch chevron. I've also uh, implemented launch chevrons and everything else, so you can you can write code that runs on Vulkan but looks like uh, CUDA. So the question is like, how did I go from um, from here, which is really just GLSL embedded straight into C++? to here, which is a uh, more, which is an idiom that, that resembles NVCC's uh, design and is, is more convenient. And how can I use the idioms that were developed on the way to improve graphics programming as well as compute? Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is show you really the first good uh, you know, GPU shader program anyone's gonna write, which is just a spinning cube. So I wrote this in 2020, so of course everything's on fire. This is fine dog. It's a normal OpenGL app. And it's written in a single C++ translation unit. So this, uh, this is just like a GLSL program. I've got multiple input and output objects to help bring information in from the input assembly into the vertex shader. This is the ones with an underscore vertex between the vertex shader and the fragment shader. And then uh, if, in both directions. So there's there's out, out parameters from the vertex to the fragment and there's in parameters from the vertex to the fragment. And they're all separate. And they each have a binding. This is a this is a, a, a location. And then I have a texture sampler right here at binding zero. 
And then I have a uniform buffer. So here's the structure for the uniform buffer. It just holds a four by four matrix and the number of seconds elapsed. And here is the uniform buffer object. And then here are my two shaders. I have a vertex shader called vert main. How do I know it's a shader? Because I use this uh, C++ attribute to, to mark it. And I have a fragment shader. So this is all the, this is like two separate source files in GLSL dumped into C++. Um, so the question is like, how do I, this is single source, just like, just like uh, CUDA. So how do I, how do I launch a program that uses these, these shaders? Well, I have uh, extensions and in circle, most of the extensions uh, start with, there are new keywords that start with an at, and I find at to be a really good token to introduce a, a new kind of uh, keyword namespace so that I don't have any uh, name collisions. So here is a extension called uh, at spear V. So you use at spear V and you name one of your shaders and this returns the mangled name of that shader within the module. And there are two additional declarations, spear V data, which is a pointer into a binary blob that is all of the, that is the compiled version of all the shaders in the translation unit and spear V size is its size. So this is a span into uh, that, that binary blob. So first I'm gonna load that, that uh, spear V binary into OpenGL runtime with GL shader binary, this is a normal call. And then I'm gonna uh, compile any of the shaders I wanna compile. So I'm compiling the vertex shader and the, frag the fragment shader into the VS and FS objects right here. And then I just link them together with OpenGL API and I have a new vertex program. And then the rest is just normal, um, you know, vertex array and set, set the modes, all that stuff. Set the um, uh, uniform buffer object to get, to get a, a update in the view projection in the seconds and the time. And we see uh, there's additional calls right here, like make rotate X. So let's look at the utility library here. I see all these functions like make rotate X, make rotate Y. These are normal C++ functions. They're not marked with anything special. They're not marked with double underscore device. So one of the, one of the beauties of this compiler is that if there's a single compiler, it makes a single pass through the translation unit and allows you to call any C++ code from your um, shader entry point. This becomes spear V code by virtue of being called from uh, something else that's spear V code. And so your, your entry points, your shader entry points, um, just call something and, and it, it pulls it into, into that binary. So this is, this is really convenient and it's easy to understand if you have any shader programming background, but it's, I think we can do better. There's a lot of visual noise here. I have a whole bunch of object declarations that don't really express much and they take a lot of space and they're ugly and it requires me to come up with names to distinguish all these ones, all these different objects. So I'm, I like to use uh, a new C++ feature, or rather it's, it's from C++ 14, but it's new to most people. And it was new to me when I started this, which is the variable template. So um, C++ 14 allows you to define uh, function templates and class templates and alias templates, but then the, the fourth kind is the variable template. So when you specialize a variable template, you get an object. So I have a variable template for every kind of storage class object that GLS supports. So input, which are um, inputs into a shader stage, like how do you get uh, input assembly into a vertex shader, uh, outputs from a shader stage. So this is an object. It has C++ attributes saying it's an input at this location, or it's an output at this location, or it's a uniform at this binding, or if it's a read-only uh, buffer at this binding, and it has a type, because it's an object, and has a name. The type is driven from a template parameter, and the binding is driven from a template parameter. So when you specialize shader in, you feed it a binding, which is an, a, either a, a, an enum or an integer, and that gets forwarded to the, um, the C++ attribute right here for, for the binding, and you give it a type, and the type might be inferred from the type of an enum. Uh, and that becomes the type of this object. So now, uh, this is the old code right here. We had all these, we had, um, all these uh, interface variables, GLSL interface variables. And in the rewritten code, they're all, they're all completely gone. So instead, I can now uh, specialize a variable template and I can get a GLSL variable implicitly created right there at the point of use. So when I want to, um, get the rotation matrix from the number of seconds. I just have to declare my uniform structure, but not an object. And I can specialize the shader uniform buffer object variable template over zero, which is the binding I want, and over the type, which is uniforms T. And that will instantiate this object with its own special mangled name. 
uh, and and I can access its members with dot dot seconds. And now I can drive uh, any number of shader stages in a single program and communicate between them and access all the resources by specializing these variable templates. So I'm specializing um, shader in to get the, the vertex attribute position. So this is like a, a value of zero, value of one, it has an associated type. This is a, a circle feature, the type genome. It allows you to just list all the, um, the, the input or output types and it will automatically assign locations to them. So it just is a, is a nice organized system for dealing with resource management. Uh, and the rest of the program is the same, but now I have something that's driven through through these variable templates. So I don't need a whole bunch of uh, objects floating around in, in the global scope. All right, so the, the next thing is to really try to exploit the C++ language to make uh, shader programming more generic and almost more CUDA-like. So let's consider a Utah teapot. This is going to use Teshelacent shaders. All right. So um, I can rotate this thing around. And this is built from, I think, 16 different um, Bezier patches. And I've got a couple of different metrics to control the tessellation layer uh, levels. So the first metric is constant. So this is view independent. So just dial in something right here, dial in a level, and you can see the, the real-time um, tessellation. Or I can do a distance-based one, which just takes the distance between the eye and uh, each uh, facet and and projects it and and gets us and you know gets a scale out so this is this is a second metric and then the good metric is edge which tries to get a constant projected edge length which is usually what you want so this will like follow silhouettes and and, and give you a nice result so there's three different metrics right here for controlling the tessellation control shader stage so i want to be able to use c to do a better job at shader programming than glsl allows so here's my teapot uh, program. It's a single a single translation unit, and it has a lot more um, individual shader entry points because it does a lot more work. So what's really interesting is that I can wrap these three different tessellation metrics, the distance metric, the edge metric, and the constant metric into, into class objects. So the constant metric is a, is a class that has a single data member indicating the tessellation level, and that's just the value of that slider. And has a member function level where you give it the, um, the the positions of the edge vertices, and it returns the tessellation level based on those edge vertices. And here it, it ignores the positions and it just gives you back the constant. The, dis the distance um, finds the uh, distance to be the camera position, which is stored as a, a data member here in tested in C class, and then it does a division. So it's just like you know, what's that distance, or what's the um, scale you want to maintain over the distance? And that returns the tessellation level as well. And then the edge base metric just does some more math to project things into screen space. So I have these three different classes, and I want to write a generic patch function. The patch function is the code that gets run once per patch to uh, figure out how to tessellate the inner and outer levels in hardware. So here's the patch function. And instead of uh, having three different ones, once for each metric, I'm going to create a single function template called patch function. And right here, you see this is not actually anything um, shader specific. It doesn't have any shader attributes on it. It's a normal C++ function, and it takes a, a normal C++ function template. Um, but I'm going to load in now these GLSL objects that are implicitly injected into the translation unit. And these correspond to the ones you get in, in ordinary GLSL. So I'm going to load the positions of the corners of the patch. And now I'm going to cast, uh, or I'm going to create a shader uniform buffer object at, at uh, binding zero with a type that's, that's passed in from the template parameter. So by specializing patch function on test constant, test distance, or test edge, I'm going to be able to get uh, those objects stored in a, shader, in, a, in a uniform buffer object at binding zero, and then can call a member function on that uniform buffer object. So this is like casting a type onto not not from another uh, object, but from a from a a, a binding um, metadata. So I can I can say I want to I want to um, access the get level member function from test edge at binding zero like this, and it's it's all parameterized. So then I have to figure out how to thread the um, the tessellation metric from the uh, host through a number of kind of containment 
uh, templates uh, down to this patch function. So uh, this patch function is named from the tessellation control shader entry point as a Dix Dixel patch constant. So this is the entry point. It takes 16 uh, input vertices. It just forwards the pitch distance through. This is like a trivial tessellation control shader, which almost all of them are. And it names this uh, function template specialization as the patch constant function. So it also takes a, uh, a template parameter, which is the tessellation metric. So test shader is a shader entry point. It has a template parameter that it passes to the patch constant function right here. And then the patch, fu patch function uh, function takes this tessellation uh, uh, metric parameter and specializes uniform buffers on it and calls data members on them. So when I go down to uh, GL specialized shader right here, you can see I'm specializing the tessellation control entry point over the three original metrics. And by doing that, I have three separate uh, programs generated from one function template. So this is a way to uh, kind of do template programming uh, right on um, uh, graphic shaders. Now, there wasn't like a super a great amount of convenience here because these are, these are very short functions. But we can go to the next, next uh, uh, sample here, which is my shader toy sample. And I've scraped like a dozen or 15 uh, very interesting looking shader toys from the shader toy website, which were written in GLSL. And I paste them into C++. And since GLSL is just like basically C, there's only a small amount of edits that have to be done to, um, to clean them up and make them compile. So these are normal GLSL fragment shaders. And I've exposed a lot of arbitrary parameters that were macro definitions at once as tunable parameters that are driven by this MGUI real-time editor. So I can change colors. Um, I can change the number of ambient occlusion samples. I can change the number of ray marching steps. And I've done this for uh, about 15 different shaders in the same translation unit. I can do. I can even do nine of them at once. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, use this variable template technique to be able to make uh, this kind of shader programming really easy and give you back more value from your from your effort. So the first thing is, I decided to encapsulate each of these individual shader toys into its own class. So the devil egg, which is that the egg marching around, uh, is its it's its own class. And it has a render member function. This is its entry point. And frag coordinate is just the, the pixel value that you're shading at that one moment. And shader toy uniforms T is like the hilt of screen resolution and the where the mouse is last click, some, some basic housekeeping stuff like that. What's really interesting is that I um, move these arbitrary parameters to be data members. And then I've marked them up with C attributes. But they're not normal C++ attributes. They're user-defined attributes. So the circle language has full reflection. And um, you can reflect over type information like what are the enums in this, what are the enumerators in this enum, or what are the data members um, or base classes in this class. We can also reflect over what are the user-defined attributes on this declaration. So here I have a imgui range float attribute. 0.5 to 5, 0.2 to 2. Now these are suggestive of ranges for a scroll bar for a slider. Uh, and that's that's what I use them for. So I have a uh, member name, zoom, big size, small size. I have a default initializer, which is when this uh, class object's instantiated, that that's the value of these, of these members. And then I have additional information to help provide a really good user experience to explore uh, the parameter space of your shader. So let's look back at the, the egg right here. And it's, it's a little small over, over Zoom, and I can't really change the size of the text. But you see that uh, I have members called Zoom, big size, small size, span. Those are the members here. And they're set to default values like 1, 0 0.8, 0 0.09, which are the default member initializers. And then they have attached sliders. So I can, I can slide through. And the range of the slider goes from 0.5 to 5, which is the values of this user-defined attribute. So I can use uh, reflection, which is part of the circle compiler, to automatically generate a user interface to uh, help you explore really any kind of data, but especially uh, uh, shaders. So 
at this at the top, I have um, my user defined attribute definitions. So I'm going to declare a user defined attribute color three, and I just it's a it's basically a um, an alias declaration, using declaration but with this attribute attribute, and I'm going to set it to void, which means it has no associated value. Just its presence indicates that this is a color three you know, as an RGB or color four as an RGBA. I have a class template here called min max, which is just the, the min and max values for a slider. I can specialize that over float or int to get a, a smooth or a discrete slider and make these user-defined attributes. Uh, I have also attributes called title and URL to help uh, transmit information from the class uh, to, the, to the consumer, which in this case is render in GUI, which builds this user interface. So I call render in GUI over the class, which contains one of the 15 different shader toys. And it loops over the member objects. So member count is a uh, circle extension, which gives you the number of non-static public data members on a class. And it loops over them. So this goes from uh, you know over all the, the data members. And then I'm going to pull out the type of that data member with the member type extension and get its name and get its uh, value. And the value is initially set by the def uh, default member initializer. Now, uh, since I have uh, a lot of metadata information, I'm gonna start checking the attributes. So if, if the member has a color four attribute, I'm just gonna create a color four widget. If it has a color three attribute, I'm gonna create a color three widget. If it's got a range flow, I'm gonna create a slider widget and it's et cetera. So by, by just uh, using basic object-oriented programming, I can write a, a fairly small function of maybe 150 lines that exposes the full parameter space of that uh, of that shader. And you can use this not just for shaders, but for anything else. Um, it's very useful for uh, helping along serialization. So you can mark a, a data member to be serialized with a special NDN or uh, a special precision, and you can reflect on that later. One other thing is that these definitions are all in straight C++. So instead of, well, in addition to compiling for Spear V, I can compile for x86. So this is rendering on the GPU, but if I click render on the CPU, I can run the same code, uh, but on the, on the host. And here I have a thread pool, and I'm gonna be running this, uh, this, this A on a thread pool, and I can change the, the detail level. And I have all these like interlacing and asynchronous uh, switches. So I can switch, be switch between GPU and CPU, you can barely tell the difference, but the, the GPU is just smoother as you'd expect. Um, what's really grand about this is that I can now debug uh, GPU code. I can debug code that is generating GPU code on the host. So I just, oops, oh yeah, that's right. So I'm gonna run the shader toy application from GDB and I've compiled it with debug symbols. So now I can choose uh, any function or any, any shader and click debug on click. And when I click now, this is going to cause a debug interrupt. So I'm gonna click right here at the point where I clicked. And you can see there's a ray sigint, which is a, a way to generate a breakpoint programmatically. So now I can walk past that, and I'm at a coordinate right here, which is 685 and 530 up from the bot from the bottom left, which is the origin of the coordinate system, which is the where I just clicked in the in the window. And now I can debug CPU code, but it's the same CPU code that the uh, that the compiler backend is using to generate the Spearby. So it's as if I were generate uh, debugging. Um, a fragment shader with uh, GDB. And so I have all the conveniences of being a host, host debugger. You know, I, it's actually doing it in real, real time. It's not like I'm exploring some recording. I can modify values and, and, and all that. Uh, also, there's a lot of um, kind of cool metaprogramming tricks I can do uh, since Circle is, you know, so, so, uh, has so many facilities for that. So, before I, I mentioned, I had this thing called a type enum, which is a normal enum, but every enum has an associated type with it. And you can query these types at compile time. So it's enum type name. In this case, I'm calling it toy, shader toys. And I'm just gonna name nine different classes. So these are not, uh, these are not the names. The names are provided implicitly like underscore zero, underscore one, underscore two, et cetera. These are the associated types. So I can create a type list of things I wanna do and then use reflection on this type list to generate behavior or generate new types. So the render call here 
um, is my entry point for rendering now a three by three grid of smaller shader toys. Uh, but the first thing I have to do is, is create an aggregate of the storage for each of the uh, individual shader toy class objects. So I can pull out the associated types from this list with the enum types, and this gives me back a type parameter pack. So this is a parameter pack. And, and this right here, operator. So if I have a, an at with a parentheses, that's a dynamic name. So any strings or integers I provide here are, con are concatenated together and then turned into an identifier. So this will um, give me back a total of nine identifiers and nine types. And since this is inside a, a class specifier, these, this becomes a member specifier declaration. And then I can expand it. So this is, a, this is another kind of circle tool, which is the ability to do parameter pack expansion in a class specifier to create more than one uh, declaration. So I've just created a declaration for each type here. And now in the render function, I want to um, kind of hash together the coordinates of the pixel I'm shading and then enter a switch. So the, the selector of the switch is the hashed X and Y coordinates. And now I have a compile time for loop, a, loop, uh, a compile time unrolled loop over the enumerators in this enum. So this is gonna range from zero through eight, but instead of giving me a number, it'll give me a compile, uh, compile time constant E, which is one of these nine different enumerators. And now I can emit the case for E. So this is, this is a way to programmatically generate uh, cases in a switch using reflection. So there's, comp there's compile time imperative programming, which is this, this meta uh, for loop, and then it's driven by the reflection right here for enum. You didn't reflect over this enum and allow me to step over it. So if uh, the selector right here matches E, and there's nine different possibilities there, then I'm going to call the render member function on one of these nine different declarations. So when I run this guy and choose thumbnail, I have uh, all, I have nine different shader toy class objects that have instantiated into their own data members. So when I scroll down, I say I have fractal traps T, clouds T, devil egg T, you see all these, uh, all these type names now have an underscore in front of them right here and become data members. And since the, I, I showed you how to use circles reflection to uh, programmatically generate uh, an MGUI user interface for one class, that works recursively. So now I'm recursing over all the data members and recursing over all their data members. So I have a total of nine different um, settings, sets of settings here to control each of these. So consider this uh, one right here, which is the bands. Where is it? Hypno bands. And now I can do things like zooming into it, change the spacing. So I have um, kind of generic access to the properties of a class object that was, in, well, that was injected generically. So uh, this is where I think becomes really um, powerful for conventional GPGPU task loads like scientific computing. Um, I worked on molecular dynamics and we had a bunch of, um, for, that's um, kind of the simulation of, of small molecules or proteins inside a, a small box of water. And you have to figure out how to approximate uh, quantum mechanical effects. And there is a, a lar lot of force field development. So how would you um, figure out forces in this particular range of electrons or in a, a larger range and how do you deal with periodicity? Um, there is a, a lot of programming you'd wanna take from some other source, from some textual source, from some metadata and carry it through your C++ program and park it in a shader. And um, C++ doesn't give you a lot of tooling to do that. A, a lot of people, write um, intermediate tools like in Python or Perl to open up a text file and then to emit C++ and then to separately compile that C++ as a pre-build step. And I wanted to get away from that in Circle. And since I have a compiler that can um, execute any code at compile time, I realized I can actually have data-driven metaprogramming. So I can load a JSON file and use that to configure a scene or con to configure a program. So I'm gonna do that with, with this, um, with this example. So here's a, another shader toy. This is one of IQ's great um, sign distance function shader toys. So there's, 20, there's 21 different shapes here. 
and they're all defined by a sine distance function. So the ray marcher goes through and it finds the distance to the closest shape given um, the, the intersection of these 21 different sine distance functions. As before, I can change their individual properties. So here's a bounding box right here and I can uh, change its properties at, at runtime. So by doing this, I'm changing, I'm, I'm using reflection to generate an IMGUI to be able to, to, to change everything here. But the layout of these objects uh, as in the original code was done, at, was done manually. So you see uh, there's 21 different self-contained class objects, bounding box, ellipsoid T, et cetera. And they each have, a, they each have uh, data members indicating their positions and they each have a, an SD, a sign distance function, which evaluates a, which takes a uh, point in space and returns the distance to that point. But they're collected into a scene manually, normally. Where is it? Sorry about that, there's a lot of code here. Here we go. So here, here's uh, what I scraped from the shader toy website. I've got a very manual definition of the shader. So I think it's really valuable for generic programming to be able to store data like this, not in C++ code, but in some other format that's both human readable and machine readable. And arguably C++ is neither of those, but JSON is. So I'm going to define two different scenes here in a JSON file. So I got one called spheres of many sizes, and uh, it has an array of five different spheres named tiny, small, medium, large, and jumbo. And they have position data, and they have uh, material data, and they have a radius. So S is the radius. Material is like a color. And I have a second one called temple, which is a bounding box in the middle and four pyramids on its corners. So these uh, types are, these, these member names, pause, H, uh, are parts of the sign distance function class objects. So if I look at uh, box, bounding box, you see the bounding box has a position as a three vector, a value B as a three vector and a value E. And the bounding box here has position as a three vector, B as a three vector and E. So I'm gonna use reflection to generate uh, both a JSON parser and to generate an IMGUI user interface uh, widget to be able to control the, the actual values of these parameters. So it's one definition of for the bounding box right here and to generate multiple kinds of code from that. So what I want to do is pound include JSON HPP and I'm going to use this at compile time to open up this scene. So as I remarked at the beginning of the talk, if you put the meta token in front of a statement, uh, this statement's executed at compile time. So I'm going to uh, create a compile time mutable object, a JSON parser called scene JSON. Um, and then I'm going to load it with, I'm sorry, let me find the string. Here we go. Now I'm going to uh, load, use a, uh, a std if stream object to load the JSON file at compile time and then pipe it into my scene JSON. Uh, object. So this is a C++ object right here that after this pipe operation has all this content, but in a, in a dynamic in-memory representation. And I'm going to print that it's loaded two different scenes. It's loaded uh, the spheres of sizes and the temple scene. And then I'm going to generate a class from this. Let me check with the, the line for that. It's here it is. So I can reflect over, oops, yeah, I can reflect over the contents of the scene JSON object using a regular for loop at compile time and emit data members. So this, this executes when you instantiate this JSON scene class template. So I give it a scene index like zero or one. If I give it zero, it'll load the first object in the scene, which is spheres of many sizes. So I have a compile time loop a ranged for loop over the objects in the, in the JSON representation. I'm going to create a member object for each of them. So I'm going to pull out the type object here, which is going to be called sphere T string in, in, in every case here. And now I'm going to convert that from a string to a type. So type ID is a circle extension, which converts a, a string to an actual type. And I can use that type to specialize uh, a shape T object. 
uh, which is a wrapper that includes uh, things like its, its material value, material property. And then I'm gonna create a, uh, this is a dynamic name. So I give it a string, the name string, like tiny, small, medium, large, jumbo, et cetera. And this then yields an identifier. So when I have a type followed by an identifier of a data member declaration. So this um, specializing this class template will cause the circle code to reflect over data loaded at compile time from a JSON file and generate uh, uh, data member declarations. And then in the constructor, I'm just going to loop over the declarations I just defined and give them default values that I pull out of here. So this, this code's a little bit messy just because it does a lot of things at once. Um, but I'm calling load from JSON, which is a, a function I wrote, and I, um, I'm giving it a the name of the object I want, and it will pull out the position, um, the, B, the B term, the E term for the bounding box, all these terms, and set them as the uh, as initializers in the constructor for each of these classes. So when I instantiate the class object, I get the value set to whatever was marked in this JSON file. So when I compile, you see it takes like two seconds or so to compile because it has to load up a 25,000 line header only parser. So it first loads this up, which is the JSON HPP. And then it uses the integrated interpreter in the compiler to load this using this. So it's all done in, in, in header, only, header only land. And so I've marked that I'm, I've loaded two scenes and I've generated a new program called Shader 2. So this is the one with the, uh, the manually defined geometry. And now I can choose spheres of many sizes. Let's slow it down a little bit. You can see now that this matches the JSON I have right here. So I've, I've used JSON to generate a function. And it's not just like any function. It's a single mathematical function. It's a sign distance function uh, that is data driven. We can see I, I can um, change the, the radius or I can change the position of a sphere or change its material value. I can do that for all of them. And so I've able to decouple um, the, the data that is used to, to generate functionality from the implementation in C++. So I, th I think this is like really exciting. This is, a, um, I think, a pretty compelling reason to um, allow unrestricted compile time C++ execution, because you can use your favorite tools that will open files and, and parse resources. You can use the existing ones, and you can just deploy it at compile time to now bring uh, code in uh, that's, you could to, to bring assets in that aren't code, but they're data and becomes kind of part of the source code. All right, now let's, let's kind of bring this back to where I started, which is looking at compute and CUDA. So you may remember this, this is one of the first ever uh, CUDA interactive demos, the particles demo, I think this is from 2008. And this came out uh, like with the first version of Thrust and it needed Thrust to do a spatial sort. So this is a smooth particle hydrodynamics demo and uh, each of these particles is hashed into a cube and the cube size is, is basically the diameter of the, of, the, of the particle. And it needs to do a spatial sort so that you can have a compact support region to do a nine by, to do a three by three th by three traversal of Weber's to figure out everything else that could be touching this, touching this cell. So it's, it's not like the n-body problem where it's quadratic time, it's actually linear time. It's gonna be linear in the number of, in the number of bodies. So it does require a, a sort and it requires a, um, quite a lot of compute. Now, this was a CUDA program and I, and I rewrote it in circle, single source and it's open GL. So this is gonna be using the modern GPU merge sort code that I wrote like, like 2013 and then I kind of refactored it and cleaned it up in 2015 or 2016. And now I've ported that to run open GL. And that's um, maybe surprising because open GL doesn't support pointers. Um, so I have to be able to use this kind of tedious binding mechanism that I showed you at the beginning where you, where you pull out um, uh, shader stage buffer objects to push all your data through. Um, and I'm able to now use tools like variable templates to abstract all of that away. And I can get code that looks just like CUDA or Sickle. All right, so this is the uh, particles code that I ported from, from the CUDA sample. So I have a uniform buffer right here. 
class for uniform buffers, the number of particles, the particle radius, the world size, the grid size, and these are all controllable through that user interface. So what's really neat about this is that I can um, do things like launch uh, compute shaders through lambdas. So the first thing I have to do is quantize the particles into cells and hash the cell coordinates into an integer uh, to be able to sort them. So here is a function called GL transform. And I'm going to pass it a C++ 11 lambda. And uh, the lambda has a default uh, closure right here. So it's equal. So it's going to pull in by value any of the objects in the surrounding scope that it names inside the function. And it's going to take a single function parameter, which is index, which is the, which is, uh, the global index of this thread within the, within the whole uh, grid. So I'm, this is going to be specialized, or it's going to be called with uh, num particles. So I expect this uh, lambda to be executed once per particle for the simulation. Uh, and this is OpenGL code, keep in mind. So it generates a uh, spear V that goes to the OpenGL driver. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dereference pause data at index. So I just want to pull the XYZ coordinates for each particle. Um, now, this can't be a pointer because OpenGL doesn't expose any pointers. So I have a positions uh, buffer object right here, and I call this bind SSBO function template. And what I get out is an iterator that behaves just like a pointer, but it's not a pointer. It has to incorporate binding information. So it returns uh, something that derives from this iterator class right here. And let's say it returns uh, read-only access. So when you specialize um, this class template, with a binding and a type, it's going to then instantiate um, or specialize a variable template with this type as its type and this binding as its binding, and then dereference that. So this iterator right here looks like a pointer, but it's not. It's an iterator that has an overloaded um, subscript operator right here that passes um, its subscript index into this access member function, which then specializes a variable template and uh, allows you to dereference that. And I can use this, uh, this infrastructure to, to, to port actual like merge sorts and radix sorts. So this is my OpenGL um, merge sort. And it's got, a, it's got the exact same logic as, uh, as the CUDA version, but it has more plumbing on the outside to be able to uh, set up these iterators that abstract the resources. When I look at just the just the, the the guts of it, this is almost entirely portable code. So this is like a one-to-one -one translation almost from the the CUDA code. I have this double underscore shared um, attribute, and this is using NVCC, and it's also supported in Circle to do uh, OpenGL and Vulkan shaders. So I can create shared memory. I can call mem mem to reg thread and and um, reg to mem thread and all these. Uh, um, uh, tr trans transformations to, to put uh, values in different orders. And I can sample the input um, parameters through this, this binding mechanism. So uh, having modern C++ like uh, variable templates and later on I, I, you know, I have good support for concepts um, allows you to create um, interface variables that um, give you all of the conveniences of, of uh, something like CUDA, which has built it, which has native pointers and, and has uh, built in support for uh, function parameter passing through kernels, but on a on what's really just a graphics API. Okay, so the last thing here I'll show you and then I can open to questions is uh, some stuff I did with Vulkan. So where is it? MGPU. Ah, here we go. All right, so this is Vulkan code. And this is a Vulkan shader that looks really similar to this to the uh, Saxby right here. So Vulkan does support actual pointers into uh, shader stage buffer objects called physical storage buffer pointers, although GLSL does not have that capability. So uh, because I'm in a C++ front end, I can I can fully implement that. Um, 
So this is now Vulkan compute code. You see, I have launch chevrons. I can specialize a function template entry point and then, and then use the launch chevron to give it a uh, num blocks. And I pass in command buffer, which has uh, different resources like, the, like the, the pipelines for queuing up operations. And then I can give it uh, function parameters. And so this looks like CUDA, but I was able to emulate this uh, in using C++ features, and I added some um, specific uh, CUDA capabilities. I also had, can launch from a Lambda, a Lambda closure like before, but now I can pull out actual pointers. So I can close on Y and close on X, but X and Y are actual pointers. Um, so you can use like Vulkan memory allocator and, and give it a flag and get physical device pointers back out. And same with transform. So this is really all the convenience of, of CUDA, except for it runs on Vulkan. So it'll run on cell phones and it'll run on, um, you know, any, any device that has, uh, that has Vulkan on it. And, almost, and all the vendors have been really good about implementing these kinds of features, even though they're not really used very much yet. Um, when you see like the Chevron, how does the Chevron work? Uh, so this is now an overloadable operator in, in Circle C++. So you can, you can use a Chevron anywhere on, a, on any entry point rather, any of the 12 entry points. So vertex shader, fragment shader, ray generation shader, compute shader, and it will call one of these functions. So in uh, a global namespace or in a namespace that's found using argument dependent lookup, have a spear v underscore chevron underscore comp or underscore frag or underscore argen function. So when you call compute shader with the chevron launch, uh, this user defined function gets found. And this allows you to um, create your own plumbing, create your own Chevron launch, where you can, it, it'll support you um, passing any parameters you want through the Chevrons and also through the function parameters. So I want to take just the number of blocks as an integer in the Chevron and the command buffer, which has, um, you know, device queue information in, it, in the launch Chevron. That then the circle compiler will forward to this. Um, function using overload resolution. And it also provides the parameters as function parameters. So these four function parameters are passed through a parameter pack. And now I'm going to create a tuple that captures these parameters. And I'm going to pass the address of this tuple as a push constant data. So the dispatch compute function is my, my true uh, launch code. And in CUDA, the runtime API um, is emitted by this takes the place of the runtime API, which is emitted by the compiler and will locate the, um, the kernel binary and pass the function parameters through it. Here, this is um, in circle, this is defined in user code, which is what you really want because launching stuff in Vulkan is a little more difficult because there's so many more degrees of freedom because you have these multi-stage pipelines and you've got a kind of a menagerie of different sorts of uh, resources you wanna pass through. So this gives you more flexibility to do your own launch uh, infrastructure. So um, Using these these tools, I was able to do a radix sort right here. As I have a uh, radix sort that does eight bits per pass and one that does four bits per pass. And um, this is kind of kind of I don't want to say naive, but it's like a really basic radix sort. And I have um, pretty excellent performance. And let me let me quickly pull up a spreadsheet for it. Should have had this going, but here we go. All right, this was, I think, two days of work to get a radix sort. So the blue is my timing right here. So this is the circle MGP radix sort, uh, which is the code right here running on Vulkan. And these other three are all different versions of thrust with different compiler versions and compiler settings. So if you just compile out of the box, you get the red thrust, which is CUDA 10.1 for SM30 or whatever the default is. And then if you choose the, um, the latest gener or the generation I have in my device, which is SM7.5, you get the yellow. And then if you go to GitHub and you pull like the experimental code, you get something with better performance. But the code I wrote that runs on Vulkan Compute and has all of this new circle features and um, advanced C++ features to kind of emulate the NVCC environment, I'm able to really quickly write a radix sort that gets as good or better performance than the, the best available version of Thrust out there. So uh, I think that's, I've talked for 56 minutes, which is perfect. So I'd like to open the discussion right now.